uh, but I would tell you something. Uh, probably you would see more cases than what I would see. Um, and the whole reason, because the population, what you the kind of Calcutta's population is far, far more than <laughs> around the and, and and that reflects the cases what you see as well. So I really think that the experience what you've got is 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 just amazing and. Uh, Unmatched. Yeah. You know, we are limited by the uh, amount are, of ancillary that we have. It's uh, really I'm sorry for, <laughs> sorry for interrupting. We are Absolutely. Almost, right. We are almost ready. ready. So I think we'll start in a minute. We are live right now on YouTube. Just give me a minute and we start. Is okay. it okay? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to this special episode of Pursue 3 Soft Tissue Special. And we are streaming live from Liverpool, UK via Kolkata. And today we have uh, somebody very special. And to moderate the session, somebody very, very special from East. And we have Dr. Professor Uttara Chatterjee, who is an MD from Ames, a professor in IPGMR Kolkata, a trainee from St. Mary's Hospital, Manchester. I would request uh, Professor Uttara Chatterjee to take over and introduce Dr. Rajiv Shukla. And then from there, we will go on. Please, Dr. Chatterjee, please take over. And I'm showing you. Thank you, Nadi. And uh, it's, my, it's, uh, it's my privilege to introduce to you Dr. Rajiv Shukla, who is from Alder Hay Children's uh, Hospital, Liverpool. Now, Liverpool, as you all know, is famous for two things. One, of course, is the Beatles. <laughs> And next is this Alder Hay Children's Hospital, which I'd like to share with you is the largest hosp children's hospital, not just in UK, but also in all of Europe. And Dr. Rajiv is the head of pathology there. And he's, he was trained in, uh, he did his MD path from PGI Chandigarh, from prestigious PGI Chandigarh. And thereafter he moved to UK. Now, as I was reading, he's done a lot of interesting papers for example, in targeted therapy in cancer, dealing with uh, rhabdomyosarcoma cell lines, right? And also he's done a lot of uh, work on, um, on microRNA networks in neuroblastoma. And another topic very close to my heart is Hirschsprung's disease. And I was very interested to know, to, to find that he's done some work, some fantastic work on ENS, that is stem cells in the enteric nervous system in the different kinds of Hirschsprung. Maybe we should have a lecture on Hirschsprungs another day. But today, today he's going to um, talk to us about modern diagnosis, modern diagnosis of pediatric ground cell tumors uh, using tools so which can pick up the DNA alterations. So pediatric ground cell tumors, as you all know, there is a lot of overlap in morphology not only morphology, there's a lot of overlap in immunohistochemistry and yet the diagnosis is so important, the precise diagnosis, because there is treatment, different lines of treatment available, the prognosis is different and the line of treatment is entirely different for the specific tumors. So the exact diagnosis is very important. And what happens is with this overlapping morphology, as you all know, more overlapping immunohistochemistry in my setup, with very limited immunohistochemistry, maybe about 20% or so, I can't go any further. And just to give you an example, just a couple of days ago, I had a sacral mass in a, in a six months old baby, a small blue round cell tumor. And in this tumor, what happened is the CD99 patchy positive, FLI1 negative, synaptophysin patchy positive, chromogranin negative, desmin myogenin, etc., all negative. So what do you do? I mean, where do you go further? Well, there are new emerging entities beyond the Ewing sarcoma. And Dr. Shukla is going to tell us about it. Dr. Shukla. Well, thank you for a very nice uh, introduction. And uh, I'll just put my... Present now and share your screen. Yes, sir. Wonderful. Your yeah, we can see your screen. Yes, right. That's it. Please make it full screen. Is it? It is. Yes. Wonderful. Please take yeah. over. Yeah. 
Uh, and uh, thanks, Dr. Chari, for a for, uh, lovely introduction for, uh, and for taking the time out to moderate and chair this session. I'm really happy that you're here to help me. Uh, and, and, and thanks, Dr. Nadeem, for giving me this opportunity to talk uh, to budding pathologists in, in India. And, and without wasting much time, uh, what we plan to do. Uh, so this is our hospital in the park uh, where I work. And uh, this is kind of a follow-up session. Uh, Dr. Gitanjali did an amazing job in her very comprehensive talk on SRCT. I'll show some cases uh, to put in practice what we have learned from, from this particular lecture. And uh, so it, it was fantastic. Now, uh, this, this I don't know, Mark Twain's editor, but it's from internet, uh, that good judgment comes from experience. And where did the experience come from? Ex from bad mistakes. And every one of us have done mistakes, uh, or we've done best what we can with the available knowledge. And, and some of the cases which I'm going to show are, are kind of uh, are old, in a sense, uh, when uh, the information what we have now wasn't there. So I had done a kind of similar presentation to a different audience a couple of years back. And since then, uh, WHO 2020 classification has come. Now, in the older classification, there was Ewing sarcoma. And the bottom two, three entities were all clubbed together as undifferentiated uh, small round cell sarcomas. Uh, these things were all there, and we were diagnosing these. Uh, but uh, WHS has not recognized that because they were not identified as an entity on their own uh, for different reasons. So we've used uh, terms like Ewing's like sarcomas and, and others. Uh, so I want to make a point here uh, that bottom three are not so round always. So we know Ewing's sarcoma and we know SRCTs, but many of the entities which now fall in the category there are not exactly round. And uh, some of them now are not Ewing's like altogether. So, so that's something we should be aware of. With that, we go to the first case. And this is really simple. And this is just to set the tone uh, of, of the, the lecture. So this was a tumor uh, in a 14-year-old boy with a, uh, in a pelvis. And, and you can straight away see that as a kind of small round blue cell, some fibrous stroma here and there. And uh, no particular differentiation. And we uh, normally make imprint smears. And imprint smears, we don't make to make diagnosis, kind of do it for, for diagnosis. We do it f uh, to do fish on them if, if uh, we need it. Uh, and the reason is the imprint smears, the cells tend to be unilayered. And, and it's much easier to do fish on them. But having said that, you can very well do fish on sections. We commonly do that as well. Uh, but we have to know the morphology here. Nice round contours, stipple chromatin, inconspicuous nuclei. You can see a dot-like nucleus, but this you will not call it prominent, and at least here in this. And we tend to have some darker cells kind of spread around. And this is what was in books has been de described as light and dark pattern. And, and if what people have said that many of these dark cells are probably in sooner or later go apoptosis. So that's the kind of understanding you go. Many of the cases will show glycogen. Again, it doesn't help a great deal. Now, what do we do when we come across small round blue cell tumor? The first thing is we try to look for differentiation. The reason being, historically, we have classified tumors uh, based on histogenic kind of histogenetic classification. So if you got a neuroblastic differentiation or ganglionic differentiation, you straight away kind of going in a line of neuroblastoma. If you see a, a malignant tumor producing osteoid, you know it's kind of small cell osteosarcoma or kind of you should be careful, but yeah, that's what we're thinking. You could have epithelial differentiation in this example of not mid midline sarcoma, but synovial sarcomas. And 
element in my like evening circle all can show in poorly diffused carcinoma the reason i'm not mentioning carcinoma altogether here because we don't see carcinoma real carcinomas in in pediatric practice i have not seen a kind of a, a, a carcinoma in lungs or prostate or breast for almost 20 years now uh, we do see carcinomas in thyroid, endocrine organs here and there, and, and, and sometimes uh, myopathelial ones, uh, but not the carcinoma. So I'm just uh, deprived of that at the moment. If it's showing a cartilage, you, you think of mesenchymal chondro. If it starts seeing, showing kind of rhabdomyoblastic difference here, rhabdomyoblastic sarcoma. If not differentiation, certain tumors have characteristic morphology, right? The rhabdoid. So what the tumors which I'm going to show you today, you have to believe me, I'll show only one slide, but then I have looked at the slide carefully, they have not shown any such uh, differentiation or any other morphological clues. And once you've not seen a morphological clues on morph count, then we go on to resort to immunohistochemistry chemistry to see if we can identify differentiation on there. And so we do myogenic markers to, to exclude rhabdomyosarcomas. Uh, if we could do myogen in myod one desmin, um, FOX two B to four neuroblastomas. Uh, like you could exclude lymphoma by, by lymphoma markers, and TLE one keratins, and, and you know all this. You also do any one because uh, some any one loss would indicate it's a kind of smart B one deficient tumor or rhabdoid tumor. And if it's in a bone, you may do SAD-B2 to exclude small cell osteosarcoma. Again, most of the tumors which I'm going to show you today, they've all been negative for this. So then you try to look for some positive markers, and there are good positive markers. And uh, Dr. Chatty, you were mentioning about uh, her case. Um, it was patchy positive, but strong diffuse membranous positivity on itself with a classical morphology of Ewing, probably you are all right calling it Ewing sarcoma, but now you've got an excellent marker, uh, NKX 2.2. So we rely heavily on uh, CD99 and NKX 2.2. We have stopped stalking FLY1 uh, altogether now. FLY1 can be used for some other purposes, but uh, not uh, for Ewing's. And so, this is a classical case of Ewing sarcoma. And you know that Ewing sarcoma is characterized by EWS fly one fusion. Uh, so that's the EWS gene. You could have various breakpoints. So you could have a various combination of EWS or fly one, depending on where the, the breakpoints are. And what you s initially it was thought that it has got some prognostic significance, but what when the larger studies came, we know that it's of no significance. As long as there is EWS fly one, the downstream cascade of uh, kind of uh, uh, proteins with, with, with kind of ultimately lead it to, to, to even sarcoma like morphology and probably clinical uh, uh, kind of uh, outcome. So how do we test these? Uh, now, easiest way to confirm what we think is easiest is, is a fish. But uh, as you know, different techniques can be used, uh, fish, PCR, or targeted RNA sequencing in clinical use. In mean, research, I think there are many more other options as well. Uh, so if we suspect, uh, based on morphology, uh, Ewing sarcoma, we normally go for, for a f f EWS break apart fish. Now, you again may be familiar and thinking it's basic, but I'll just uh, tell you so that everyone is on the same page. So in a break apart uh, fish probe, you will have two different uh, probes colored differently with a different fluorophores. In this case, it is orange towards the Central American and uh, green towards the the telomeric-American, and in a normal cells, we know we, we have got a pair or we have got uh, two sets of genes, so both the 22 should have uh, Ewing's gene, and they, the, the orange and the green signal should be together because it's just a flanking kind of probes, so they are 
nicely orange and green together and both the chromosomes. What is happening in our case? You can see on one chromosome it is fine, the, the green end and the telomeric and the contrimic are together, but then on the other chromosome probably it has gone further away. That means part of EWSR1 has moved out to some other chromosome. And, and this kind of confirms uh, uh, that probably we are dealing with EWS uh, uh, eating sarcoma. Now, the good thing is that 90 to 95% of our cases will be like this. And this is nearly a nice illustration. Can you see EWS R1 fly one? Nearly 90%. And then you have got some rare things which, which we uh, see how, how to come to diagnosis too. So for all practical purposes, if the morphology is typical and tumor is diffusely membranous, CD99 positive, there is no need for doing molecular tests and probably you are all right. So, uh, so that's the lesson from this one. The common things are common. Don't think of fancy diagnosis and then you'll be all right. So when do we need molecular diagnosis? If there is unusual clinical presentation, it's good to confirm a diagnosis. Atypical morphology, unusual immunoprofile, or sometimes even you have insufficient material also, uh, it might be useful. Now this is a picture from internet. Uh, uh, I just could have got from our own cases, but just didn't think that it was needed. Uh, so this is a classical morphology of typical evenings tend to be round in conspicuous nuclei. This is a large cell variant or atypical evenings type, what we call, which tend to have a larger nuclei irregular nuclear margin and, and tend to have nuclear prominence. And it is this group we should be aware of. L many of these would still be evings, but some of them could be some other tumor. Then we used to call uh, tumors with kind of these rosettes uh, as P and Ed because they are showing neuroectodonal differentiation, but we now know that probably it's all better to club them together because they carry the same EWS fly one translocation and, and kind of similar kind of prognosis. So as I said, this is the atypical cytomorphology you should be aware of. And then there are some atypical features uh, otherwise. If you start seeing spindling, the saying epithelioid, mixoid chain, normally even sarcoma is stroma poor. You can have some kind of fibrous bands here and there, and uh, but then if you've got a very dominant sclerosis, again, uh, start thinking. There is an adenomantinoma-like uh, evings as well, so you can have a good epithelial differentiation in them. They tend to occur in head and neck regions, so you should be aware that you could have a squamous uh, uh, differentiation in evings. With that, we go to the second case. Uh, so this is a 17-year-old boy with a right arm tumor. Morphology is very similar. You can see some clearing, cytoplasmic clearing, which is a glycogen. And then uh, cytomorphology is reasonably uh, similar to what we've shown. Uh, again, uh, everything negative. And we tend to do SAT B2 only when there is kind of differential diagnosis with the uh, uh, small cell osteocarcinoma, so it is in bone and it was negative. In this case, it is positive for CD99. Uh, and in this case, when we got it, it we didn't have NKX 2.2. And we straight, so good uh, membrane of CD99 was the only clue that this could be uh, eating sarcoma. But when we did our Evening's break apart probe, it showed a normal pattern. Can you see that orange and green they are sticking together? So what's happening here? When you have an atypical kind of uh, results on molecular tests, you should always try to see if you could confirm or kind of confirm that it is negative with other techniques. And we did RT-PCR on this, and it showed positive for kind of uh, EWS fly and fusion transcript. So something is was happening that one technique is showing 
uh, positivity and probably which was well with our kind of impression. And then we went to do what we call as EWS fly one fusion probe. And in this case, uh, sorry, I don't have the guide of the probe, but I'll, I'll tell you what uh, the probes are. So you have two green probes on Ewing sarcoma gene 22. So, so instead of two different colors, they are all both greens. So they are seen together as two dots. Can you see? So this is chromosome 22, and these are normal. So that's why we are not seeing breaking apart. In, we also have a single red or orange probe, which should be on the fly one gene on two different chromosomes. What we saw that, OK, the one signal was dark as usual. The other signal is it's kind of weaker. And part of it is broken and attached to fly one. So it is actually not the rearrangement we normally see, but this is a microinsertion of part of fly one into EWS, probably leading to the similar kind of protein uh, and, and, and hence the, the morphology and Ewing sarcoma. So you could have rarely uh, cases where, where the EWS break apart probe will fail. And in these cases, complementary techniques will help. And again, I'm making a point, NKX2.2 and Memrys CD99 together are, are, are good markers. So this is a 16-year-old boy uh, with a retroperitoneal tumor. Again, you can appreciate the light and dark cells, similar morphology. And what we have is the, this, the, all our differentiation marker negative, and again, nice CD99 positive, NKX2.2 positive. We are thinking of this is going to be Ewing's. And what happens again? There's a classical morphology, classical chemistry, chemistry but uh, the break apart probe didn't split. RT PCR also is negative. And then in these cases, uh, we start using other markers. In this case, ERG is positive. And, and you know by now, because this T, what I'm coming to, we know that FUS and ERG are kind of in a similar group of uh, uh, kind of, uh, genes. Uh, we call the TET family or FET family. And, and this, again, is an old case when this was not so well known, and but there was this uh, paper, uh, one of the first descriptions of uh, a FUS and with ETS transfusion leading to kind of similar kind of tumor uh, evenings, and and we go on to do FUS rearrangements, and this again is a break apart probe, and you could see the FUS probe is nicely broken, and and it is indeed. Aving sarcoma with FIS RG uh, uh, translocation. So the lesson is that if you have EWS negative in a SRCT, which is undifferentiated, it's good to do FUS. You might just uh, make a diagnosis there and need not do more complex uh, tests. So the classic Aving genetics now, as we know it, is part of FET genes, which is FUS, EWSR, and TAF15, when rearranged and fused with ETS uh, genes, which are quite a few, FLY1, ERG, ETV1, ETV4, FEV, and ETV5, possibly. Uh, now, all these lead to similar kind of downstream transcripts, probably, and Ewing sarcoma. So this is what is uh, classical genetics now. So it is not only EWS fly one. Any FET plus any ETS translocation is uh, Ewing sarcoma. TAF15 has got a great homology because of the same group. So they are very much similar to EWS first. But so far, we have not seen it in a clinical, uh, a clinical case of uh, um, Ewing sarcoma with this translocation, and possibly one day, or probably they just don't 
uh, translocate so easily. Now, with, uh, is it all right or am I going too fast or too slow? You're fine, you're fine. Oh, thank you. So the next case is an eight-year-old girl uh, with a soft tissue tumor in the neck. And part of it was extending into to the thorax, kind of part of the thorax. And what is striking here is, is the kind of nodular arrangement with kind of wider collagenous fibrous septae. There was some uh, calcification as well. And when you see the morphology, it is it's different from Ewing's. Its, it's cells were much larger, and there is kind of conspicuous nuclei. So this is kind of atypical Ewing's kind of uh, cellular morphology that we talk of. Um, and in some other areas, there were kind of mixoid change. So you could see a lot. And I was telling that this is kind of unusual, although occasionally being described. So you would like to do molecular tests on this one for sure. So let's see what's happening here. The usual kind of initial screen negative. CD99 membrane is positive, but it is patchy. Uh, again, it's an old case. Uh, initially, uh, FLY1 uh, and NKX2 were not done. And Based on, uh, yeah, EWSR1 was rearranged. Again, I don't have a picture because it's an old case, but uh, in the report it says that EWSR was rearranged. So we've got membrane is CD99, EWSR rearranged. It is kind of consistent with e e Ewing's and PNAT, uh, although bit atypical. Uh, but these are the cases where you should like to see uh, the mm, kind of molecular confirmation. So first thing, when we uh, got NKX 2.2, we tried uh, this on our this tumor. So NKX 2.2 is, is really good marker for Ewing's. It came out of expression profiling of translocation proving Ewing sarcomas. So that, and and so that was kind of upregulation of NKX 2.2, and then uh, the clever people start making antibodies against the protein in NKX 2.2, and it has been found fairly specific and sensitive, more than 90% uh, sensitivity and specificity, and it has been shown positive to be positive in olfactory neuroblastoma, some mesenchymal chondrosarcomas, and some other type of uh, as round cell tumors. But these don't come into differential diagnosis in our practice. Uh, olfactory neuroblastoma, you can make diagnosis by other means, and then probably you will, because of sight, and, 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 and you'll make it, it's easy. So, and if you see it together, they are 98% specific. Uh, e is NKX 2.2 and CD99. And our case, case four, is uh, in case 2.2 negative, and then you start thinking now this is uh, very atypical for Ewing's. Although EWSR break apart probe is uh, kind of broken, we still need to do something. And the reason is that EWSR gene is one of the most notorious gene. It is extremely promiscuous, and it partners with different genes to lead to very many different tumors. And so you can see, and this is not the exhaustive list. So the, there are more to it. And I find it even more interesting is that with the same partner, it causes different tumors. So if it see WSR1, Krebs1 fusion, leads to clear cell sarcoma of soft part, as well as angiometal fibrocystic cytoma. Similarly, for fives, <laughs> to be able to surprise that uh, EWS are when FLY1 has been occasionally been described in neuroblastomas and, 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 and giant cell tumor of the bone as well. So it is very promising, and, you, and it's important to confirm the partner to confirm the diagnosis uh, of what you're probably dealing with. And so we got another uh, different probe, uh, which is a fusion probe with break apart. 
So here what you've got a usual break apart row with, uh, with orange and green, EWS, and then there's a different color flow for all for the fly one. So if EWS fly one fusion is there, the orange part or the centromeric part of the uh, EWS will break apart and move and should go close to fly one, which is blue. But then in other cases where there is EWSR rearrangement, but it is to a non-fly one partner, it would be seen as a separate dot to both blue and green. And what we see in this case is here. So that's the the one of the chromosome where the EWS gene is not broken. Here it is broken. And instead of this orange going to a blue, it has stayed some gone to some other chromosome. We don't know where. So this kind of confirmed that we are dealing with some different EWS translocation. It could still be an ETS partner and could still be Ewing's. So how do we confirm? Now the fish becomes a little bit too much uh, because we have to individually go and look for all those different partners to confirm which partner it's going to in this particular tumor. And so the easier way is to do a RNA sequencing where it's a high throughput technique and uh, at the moment we have a sarcoma panel uh, which covers most of the genes and uh, which are translocated in these. Um, so it's a kind of 60 gene uh, panel. Uh, people, uh, there is an, uh, we have access to in another lab of kind of usual RNA scan fusion through the kind of from Illumina one, the 500 genes one. But if you go for a bigger, bigger, bigger panels, you're more likely to get your results delayed, it takes much longer. And again, uh, it's the rapidity of fish which we go for for quicker diagnosis. And these targeted fusion panels are still quicker and cheaper. So you can find the same thing on a whole exome sequencing. But there's no point in doing because they're very expensive, very time consuming, and come up with a lot of different results, which probably you'll not know what to do with. So targeted sequencing is the best option. So the, the, what target sanctions for the panel of genes, what you think are, are most likely to get involved. So this case has shown EWS R1, POW5, F1 fusion. And when you see that, so when we were seeing the initial classification now, so it was even sarcoma, which was EWS ETS gene, not EWS, but FET and TET versus ETS fusion, and then FET with non-ETS fusion. And these all are kind of non-ETS genes, and FAT, POW5, smog bees, and, and all these is, are have shown to be an evening's like morphology. But EWS R1, POW5, 1 translocation has been described in evening's like tumor, but most of most commonly it's been described as soft tissue myopathial tumors. It has been uh, described with hydradenomas, mucoepidermoid carcinomas. So this could be uh, a, a myopathial tumor. And so to, to test that, we did A1 in EMA and S100, they were positive. But epithelial marks were very patchily positive. I'll say you have to search for them. And even in this field, which where we saw positivity, it was just three or four cells. Or EMA was little more, but still less than 5% of cells. Uh, S100 was little more positive, around 20-30%. So this, in fact, is most likely a myopathial carcinoma, uh, but you could have very well called it as uh, undifferentiated uh, SRCT with or evenings like sarcoma with uh, uh, EWSR POW5 uh, fusion. Now, I think we uh, die, uh, 
myopathal tumors are underdiagnosed in pediatric practice. And when these tumors occur in children, they are more often malignant. So 65% of the myopathal tumors in children are going to be malignant. Around 10% of these show undifferentiated round cell component, uh, um, and in fact more, and one, one third show in it from, a, from a, another study. They tend to metastasize and, 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 and tend to have a bad prognosis. So I think this is a difficult diagnosis, and I still don't know uh, whether that amount of uh, S100 positive EWS, uh, uh, kind of, sorry, a CD9 and uh, epithelial positivity is sufficient to make a diagnosis, but probably it is, and I'll tell you why, or what's happening in this particular uh, entity. So what is the gold standard? Is it morphology? immunophenotype or myopithelial gene features, and then this is what is interesting. So morphological spectrum is quite wide, and nearly one-third of them can show evenings like morphology, and of the 10 person can have a very uh, diffuse uh, presentation of this. Uh, does anyone want to say anything? Hello? Uh, yes, uh, please carry on. Okay, sure. So, so on a needle, so as I said, one third of these tumors can show these evenings like morphology. So on a needle core biopsy, that's what we get normally. It could be a really hard diagnosis when you will not actually see uh, myopathial differentiation. So morphology obviously is 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 not one. Now, historically and probably currently, co-expression of epithelial markers with S100 is, is kind of what we considered as a, as a myopithelial phenotype. It is positive in, in quite a few. Now, if you see, it's 93 to 100% and S100. Now, in studies where it is 100% is because of the fact is they have used it as a defining feature of myopithelial. So if you define something by a criteria is going to be 100% positive, but in that case, you'll be missing certain cases. I hope not. I'm sure. Again, EMA not 100%. GFAP SOX10. SOX10 is a good marker, but it is negative in a lot of them. P63, which is considered uh, a reasonable marker in salivary gland, is not so in soft tissue myopathial tumors. Anyone is lost in only subset of cases. In this case, it wasn't. And myogenic markers, again, are variable. So in most cases, with a morphology and this morphology, probably you will think of uh, myopathial tumor, but it, it's not always easy. Now, this, this uh, paper from Antonovsky group and uh, it showed that 20% of cases lack the typical immunoprofile of a, of, a, of my, my epithelial cells as we know it. So they were, these markers, negative. And all the five cases had undifferentiated around cell morphology with the kind of variable gene fusion, including the one which we've seen in our case. And Probably we need further studies and further understanding uh, is need to establish the relationship of these kind of undifferentiated tumors harboring so-called myopathial gene fusions with even sarcoma-like uh, tumors uh, uh, or e even uh, with non-ETS uh, fusion sarcomas. So we, I, we probably this is what I said is uh, the diagnosis, but uh, based on focal S100 and an e, uh, epithelial marker, this most likely is uh, my epithelial carcinoma. It's not sarcoma, sorry. Uh, this is error. No, I should. So this lesson is that uh, NKX2 point in negativity should raise some doubt to the diagnosis evenings. And, and, and prompt molecular confirmation. EWSR gene rearrangement or break apart does not equate to even sarcoma, and partners are really important for phenotype. You've seen this. And then some molecular gene rearrangements can lead to different morphology and probably different clinical entities. 
So same molecular gene, different diseases, and you wonder what to do with these cases. And so what I'd suggest that don't take marker, a genetic marker as kind of as a diagnostic of an entity if, if there is an alternative possibility as well. So this is what's happening. So you see EWSR when goes to ETS group of genes, it is Evings. Then you have a lot of non-ETS genes. And uh, but if you see WHO classification recognizes only EWS and FATC2 and EWS pad z one at the moment. And the whole reason is all other tumors are rare and we still don't know much about them to classify them as a disease entity or on their own. Uh, this we've learned a little bit, probably we'll still need to mo know more. And uh, hopefully in the future, either there are more entities who are going to come here, or those entities will be pushed to other differentiated categories as uh, kind of EWS, POF1, myopathial tumors has gone to other category uh, of tumors. Uh, how am I doing? 15.40, yeah, good. Yeah. Absolutely fine. You are doing fine. This was an excellent case of myothelial carcinoma with Ewing's like morphology. And as Dr. Kirti has, uh, Dr. Kirti Gupta, who has just joined us, is, and she has written that morphological spectrum of myothelial carcinoma is wide. She's and she has reported one in the of a myope, of a, she has reported a case of myothelial carcinoma uh, in in a kid in the brain. But uh, as you said, the uh, as you have very rightly pointed out that GFAP is not always positive in these. You, you said only 25% may be positive, but S100 and the markers that you have done, it is, but most most often we don't think of a myoepithelial carcinoma. That is the problem. Uh, I totally agree with you. I, I think, uh, and as I said, uh, we didn't make this diagnosis in first instance. Uh, uh, so, uh, very well. I think uh, thanks uh, for telling me that Kirti is also around. Uh, uh, and with this, shall I move on to the next case? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So this one is, is a 16-year-old male uh, with mass in the right elbow, soft tissue. And this case presented with the widely disseminated kind of at the time of presentation itself. Uh, so that kind of a soft tissue and tumor, the bones appear fine, there were liver mets, there were vertebral lesions and there were kind of lesions in the pelvis and so it's, it's disseminated. And our clinicians uh, were telling that uh, this is unlike Ewing straight, kind of the differential diagnosis was not Ewing's in there clinically obviously. Although you do see disseminated evenings, I'm not telling that, but it is unusual to start with. So what we're seeing here is again a, a kind of nodular pattern with, with, with fibrous septae. Uh, you're seeing them big, but these are needle cores possibly, yes, and, and, and uh, I think this was a scan. And so you've got broad fibrous septae and then you've got these kind of why these pink areas basically geographic areas of necrosis. Again, you see necrosis, some of the fibrous septa. Uh, morphology again is not typical of uh, Ewing's. They are much more oval uh, and some conspicuous kind of nuclei, can you see here? So atypical kind of morphology, broad fibrous septae. And when we did CD99, it is just focally positive. I would not say focally, it was patchy, but kind of, uh, I would say 10% areas uh, showed this kind of positivity, uh, which was membranous, by the way, you could see nice membranous positivity. And fly one is positive as well. So you would 
think this again is an old case and these were the two markers which were done initially and with CD99 membranous and fly one uh, it was thought to be evings and uh, these markers we have done now so it was not done before but it's quite convincingly if, uh, at that time when, when this diagnosis was made when we know that uh, the EWS fly one fusion leads to Ewing sarcoma and fly one is, is diffuse nuclear positivity you would obviously think of uh, uh, Ewing sarcoma and uh, this is just I extracted the reports and then you did the usual molecular which was available so we did EWS uh, and we did the uh, Sunnyville sarcoma uh, and uh, DSRCT and alveolar labdo kind of translocation. So uh, EWS, SIT6, and uh, PAX37, and those were all negative. And then it was concluded that even though there is no EWS translocation, it is best considered that this tumor is even uh, uh, P and ET. That's what I used to call. As we know, there's an atypical morphology. Uh, cytologically, but there's some the kind of make sort of change as well, and this kind of uh, morphology and kind of clinical presentation uh, raises uh, what we now know as an entity of sick rearranged sarc uh, sarcomas, and these are the Yoshida group presented uh, 20 cases um, and summarized the clinical and, and morphological spectrum of these things. And they kind of stressed on this nodular arrangement with broad septae, and, and this has got very similar kind of nodules as in our case. But then you have much more diffuse, uh, small round blue cell areas, but yeah, again, atypical nuclear prominence in some of them. And, and, and in the, from the paper, they said they see nuclear prominence at least vocally in most of them. Few of them can be indistinguishable from Ewing, so that's uh, the classical Ewing sarcoma like morphology. Mixoid change, spindling, cytoplasmic clearing. All the, the reason I'm showing it because with my one case, you will not know the whole spectrum, but with these kind of bigger studies, uh, the whole whole exercise here is to learn uh, rather than than kind of diagnose the case uh, what what I am showing and what was classical both was that all of them were in case 2.2 negative but they were strongly positive for WT1 uh, in the A paper they didn't tell whether it's against C terminal or in terminal um, but I, I've seen these two are posit being positive for both uh, CD99, the stress was that it tend to be patchy, very much like our case. And, and, and Mach 4 can also be patchy positive. So calretinin again, it can be positive. And if you see what features were distinguishing it from even sarcomas was lobulation, necrosis again, more common, atypical nuclear morphology, nucleolus, more cytoplasm spindling, mixoid change, all these things should prompt you to think about this entity. And, and But again, it is, I like these kind of tables when there is a zero on the side where you know it is never seen so that you can rely on this. Now, in an individual case, if you say necrosis, it doesn't help because in a neural case you can have necrosis in sarcoma and all these things for particular cases may not be helpful. but things like uh, mixoid change, although we can occasionally see, but if it is dominant, it is not Ewing's. And similarly, uh, if you see NKX 2.2, zero, and, and, and that is very helpful. I like these kind of tables with zero on one side. So this kind of absolute discriminatory. So these tend to be usually extraskeletal, most often in extremities, aggressive cause with early metastasis, atypical thousand words. So I think I'm repeating myself, but for a reason, so that it cuts ingrained uh, 
all these features. And I'm going to repeat once more uh, a little ahead. And these tumors are different clinically as well. If you see the survival data, we've got a survival of 77-78% uh, in leaving sarcomas whereas down to 40-45% in, in sick rear in sarcoma. So they're really aggressive and, and they didn't do well. Uh, then a bigger study came and probably these two studies, uh, Yoshida and Antoneski's study, probably defined this entity in such clarity that uh, WHO has to recognize it and include it in a, as an, a separate uh, entity. And again, it, it kind of highlights the similar things tend to occur in soft tissue, uh, very uncommon in bone, 3%, and very, very similar histological features stressed on, the, I, I'm again repeating it for a reason, it's kind of uh, that it gets ingrained in what we, we look for. So nodular pattern, fibrous septis, spindling, mixoid change, or reticular pattern rarely. Interestingly, mixoid change is seen in, in one third of cases, and 10% of cases, this could be a dominant feature. And in these tumors, they tend to have uh, the lack fibrous septis. It's kind of mutually exclusive. So once you have a lot of mixoid change, uh, less fibrous septis. But on a needle core biopsy, your differential diagnosis is going to be very different from what we are undertaking now. You'll think of mixoid uh, tumors uh, and, and, and probably tangentially uh, to, to what we believe sick uh, uh, or even slight sarcomas. Uh, but still, uh, predominant phenotype was that of solid sheets with round to ovoid cells. So ovoid cells, so they don't tend to be that round. Uh, there was focal, you can say, epithelioid morphology and plasma cytoid morphology. Again, these tumors can be mistaken for uh, morphologically for myopathial tumors. Nuclear morphology, again, variable. So, so uh, from from dark or hyperchromatic to atypical to evings like uh, nuclei. As with all translocation or uh, kind of fusion sarcomas, these tend to have minimal or no nuclear pleomorphism. So they are kind of malignant and aggressive looking. But if you see what we talk of nuclear pleomorphism uh, is normally not there. This is an exceptional case probably here. And the reason, and, and it's true for any translocation sarcoma, monomorphism, and as compared to a kind of very pleomorphic sarcomas where you tend to have any ploidy and, and those kind of things where you've got lots of chromosomal gains, you've got la large number of uh, kind of chromatin and, and individual cells that making it big. So as with any other translocation sarcoma, this tend to have minimal or minor nuclear pleomorphism only. And, and, and you tend to see nuclear prominence, at least mild to medium in most most cases. Again, I'm talking about the immunohistochemistry, um, PATI CD99, and, and, and um, it's more common. They have seen diffuse membranous positivity in minority of cases, so it should not uh, kind of uh, take you away from uh, this diagnosis. And, and WT1. So what we have come to know is that WT1 is a good marker, and Patchiness of CD99 is a good clue. So uh, that's what it is like. I think I have talked all about this uh, uh, earlier, but it's in a summarized in a table form. Uh, worse outcome, and they are chemo resistant, and this tumor also showed minimal response. Uh, then there are some other good markers, and uh, one of them is ETV4, and it's because the sick tux uh, kind of rearrangement whenever it happens, there is kind of upregulation of ETV4 and overexpression. So it has got a very, very strong sense 
activity and, and reasonable specificity. And I've been harping about CD99 membranes with diffuse NKX 2.2 for Ewing sarcoma. And now I'll start harping about ETV4 and WT1. Uh, in a great context, this combination is, is really, really specific for, for sick uh, rearranged sarcomas. And, and this was a summary from one of those papers. And you see, I like seeing zeros. And if you see a lot of zeros here, many of the entities, there are some cases which can be positive. One of them is DSRCT, where, which is interesting because WT1 is also positive. So, uh, but then you know how to diagnose DSR, DSRCT based on other markers uh, of kind of polyphenotypic and location and all those things. Wilms tumor, again, is really going to be on differential diagnosis. It's, it's going to be fairly straightforward. Small cell carcinoma, we rarely see in periodic age group and melanoma again. So probably you will have other helps in these things. Now, with regards to unclassified round cell sarcoma, this could very well be one of those cryptic sick tox, uh, rearrange sarcomas, I don't know, but it's likely. Uh, now, I was talking about fish and cryptic fusion in evenings we've shown. Cryptic fusions in sick is even more common. I said that 10% of cases will not show uh, translocation uh, based on sick break apart, uh, but it'll be shown with other techniques. And then so, so probably, this could be explained by that. So overall, very good marker for uh, for for sick rearing sarcomas. And together, both ETV4 and 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 WT1 together are really good. So again, I don't have a picture because it was sent out and someone else did it for us. Uh, it's a sick break apart was broken in this one, and it was uh, diagnosed as sick sick uh, rearing sarcoma. Uh, is it okay to move on to next case? Absolutely, and thank you for showing us all the differences between sick or uh, sick rearranged sarcoma and the evenings step by step. Thank you so much for going through it in details. Thanks, sir. Now this is an abdominal tumor in a four-month-old male. It's a, a paravertebral uh, tumor, fairly big uh, and not localized to any organs. And, and this, this was a very difficult tumor for us. And you can see a central mass. And it was encasing uh, all the vessels. So it was surgically non-resectable. We've kind of multiple times we uh, took this case to MDT and surgeon said, no, this, it's probably if you try to do anything here, it would just uh, be catastrophic. And uh, so this is how it looked. So it is kind of, you can see there are hypocellular myxoid-like areas, and then very cellular blue areas, which, which can very much look like synovial sarcoma uh, uh, bluishness. And in the, the cellular area, it was kind of whirling. There were still capillaries prominent. And you can see these capillaries prominent, much more prominent branching capillaries in, in, in a kind of myxoid areas. Some clustering of cells, again, very bland in a sense that they're monomorphic nuclei. They were mitotic figures. Uh, so it was, we knew that it and, uh, kind of it is an aggressive neoplasm. Um, and when we did, Immunos, it was TLE positive, BCL2 positive, CD99 had a strange pattern, only kind of dot-like positivity uh, in the silent walnut cluster around. So when the TLE we've been using very reasonably well for synovial sarcoma diagnosis, so and BCL2 as well. So you can see influential role of BCL2 feminine in synovial sarcoma. So, could this be a sanable sarcoma uh, with TLE and and uh, things? Uh, what other thing is common in this age group when in an infant? We always think of a, a fibroblastic uh, tumor, which looks like anything of infantile fibrosarcoma. 
And we wanted it to be uh, infantile fibrosarcoma because of NTRK3, we could have treated it uh, medically because there was uh, a kind of uh, with NTRK inhibitors. But no, scientists, the, the fish for cyanosarcoma was negative and repantrk isc was negative and, and, and which is very sensitive for TRK rearrangement. So we, we use it in all, most of our tumors because uh, our, we are looking for targets. It is not specific for NTRK gene rearrangement, but it's very sensitive. So you, we use it as screening, screening test. We still went on to do ETV6 uh, NTRK3, which was also negative. So it is not cyanobyl sarcoma, it is not infantile fibrosarcoma. There's an entity called primitive myxoid mesenchymal tumor of infancy, PMMTI. And it was described way back in 2006. And again, the morphology was described as infantile fibrosarcoma, infantile fibromatosis like, tend to have myxoid areas. And uh, but these were diagnosed based on negativity of rearrangement, which is considered typical of uh, infantile fibrosarcoma. Now, it has got predilection for deep soft tissue around the spinal cord and paravertebral area, very similar to our case. These are more aggressive than uh, infantile fibrosarcomas, poor response to chemotherapy, and, and they can transform to a, a kind of more undifferentiated sarcoma over a period of time. Uh, now, so the surgery wasn't an option. We didn't have an option for NTRK3 inhibitors, so we tried evening side kind of chemo on this patient and didn't respond to that. And by 2016, we have a, a kind of a paper which said that these tumor morphologically resemble Clarissa sarcoma and possibly they could have the same gene rearrangement. It was proven to be so. So these tumor tend to show recurrent B core internal tandem duplication, ITG, uh, and, and some of them show Yahe and not MB2 fusions. And the morphologies can be varied. Uh, and then and, and you can have a cellular fibrous septum, myxoid chains tend to be prominent, but very typical kind of vascular branching, what we tend to see with clear cell sarcoma, but morphology again is variable, but these uh, features do kind of resemble clear cell sarcoma. Now, we get, again, we like immunohistochemistry or less than molecular markers to make this diagnosis. And that's why I'm sending these papers, the paper showing this paper so that you know that we can make these diagnoses without actually uh, doing molecular workup. So there is B core or BCL2 expression is increased in these tumors and because of this uh, kind of internal tandem duplication or rearrangement. So we did BCL6 first, these tumors were strongly positive, and then there was a paper saying that B core or expression is highly sensitive marker for lung sarcomas. And when this tumor came, we already had this antibody in our lab, and our lab was standardizing it. Uh, and luckily, um, we said you do it uh, in next couple of days, and they did it. We've got a wonderful technical staff here, uh, and and we run this, and it was B-core positive. So we gave uh, that kind of diagnosis, confirmed the diagnosis would be uh, uh, primitive myxoid mesenchymal tumor of infancy, which was kind of months later confirmed to have B-core internal tandem duplication. So I say these tests, some of the molecular tests take a long time. I have already exceeded my time, uh, and, and, and so this was the diagnosis. Now, we were looking to treat this patient, uh, and, and nothing was working. And so we did home, whole exome sequencing to find any targets. Uh, again, I don't have the report, but it says that there is, they found something which makes it kind of possibly it could respond to immunotherapy. Um, and uh, so we said, OK, uh, uh, the, the PDL one inhibitors and 
which I was quite a spect skeptical because uh, in infants, this uh, PDL1 therapy doesn't work. And the reason being, you to the immunotherapy active, you need a lot of mutations so that you start expressing a lot of new epitope on the surface. And pediatric tumors in general tend to be very low on the mutation burden is really low. So they are less likely to show antigens on the surface which can be killed by immune cells. So that's the kind of simple explanation. Not only that, this tumor appeared in four months of life. Probably it was a congenital tumor. And you know what happens when T cells are exposed to antigens in utero. They, they are identify them as self and they become tolerant to it. And we ultimately didn't use it. Uh, and this patient didn't do well. What is interesting about this particular uh, group of tumor is that uh, so this B core internal tandem duplication. Then there is a the tumor B core CCNB3 and B core mammal 3. All these show a very very similar expression profiling, and they cluster together. As kind of, and this cluster is very different from six sarcomas or living sarcomas. So they are individually very close to each other rather than closer to any of those and probably because of the uh, the same gene and same downstream things. Uh, the, the first B-core uh, Rian sarcoma to be diagnosed was BCL, uh, B-core CCNB and, and it was clearly shown that this was very different all came all, all together as compared to the, any other sarcomas which could look like this. And same thing was proven again and again. B core mammal three very different from sick and EWS far one morphology. We have talked; they all share the similar morphology of these kind of vascular pattern and then uh, grouping, spindling, mixoid change. And I'm not going to say mixoid change. So whether they are translocation or or B core inter morphologically, they are very similar. On immunohistochemistry, it is interesting, and, and now you'll know why TLE1 was featuring positive. They tend to be TLE1 positive, and they tend to be SAT B2 positive as well. And, and many of these kind of translocation uh, sarcoma, these ones, occur in bone. And if you read SAT B2 there, you would make it a small cell osteosarcoma, so be wary of that. I'm not going to talk about this, uh, and uh, so these are kind of in new WHO. They have been grouped together uh, because they show similar kind of uh, morphology, not very similar, but there is overlap in similar immunoprofile, and that is uh, B core oncogenic upregulation. Transcriptonics shows similar profile, so this is kind of coming up as one entity. Uh, uh, but you have to be aware that these B core CCNB tend to occur in bone, whereas uh, B core ITD tumors tend to occur in soft tissue, so that's something. I just want to put this kind of uh, discussion uh, slide in the end because I'm just confused. Um, Okay, when do we, what, what are we trying to do here when we are trying to classify tumors? Are we trying to classify based on similar morphology as we have done in past, similar transcriptome, uh, or, or driving functional rearrangement, or a similar kind of clinical behavior? And probably all of these need to be there to, to make it identifiable as a, as a new entity, but it's the promiscuity of these fusion is, is, is very, very worrying because B core arrangement can be seen in muscular cells around the sarcomas, which you're seeing. It can be seen in ossifying fibromyxoid tumors, which many of them are benign. You see in high grade endometrial sarcomas, renal sarcomas, and PMMTI. All these obviously are not a single entity and probably. Uh, a, they have their own kind of nuances. Again, 
same genetic does not necessarily mean it's a common therapeutic approach either because if you see with the and the many trials which have been called the basket trials where we find a, a, a genetic abnormality and target it, uh, they don't respond, all of them don't respond. And, and, and the best example is, is the BRAF. If you see uh, BRAF response in non-melanoma cancers, it's kind of very variable. Um, there has been some good success stories as well, and, and so far in TRK targeting is, is really sounding very promising. And so there is a reason to group them or at, le at least tag them with their translocation so that uh, we are aware that probably there is, could possibly be a target therapy. Um, but I always think that uh, the sarcoma diagnosis and classification should take into a uh, genotype. The same genotype occurring in which type of cells? So a same genotype occurring in an epithelial cell leak to different tumor than an undifferentiated uh, cell. Environment sort of where they are growing. So uh, a clear cell sarcoma in, uh, in kidney is very different from uh, PMTI possibly. Uh, and, 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 and phenotype morphology and, and, and clinical behavior. So uh, we should be lumping them together once we have really a solid evidence. Now, I'll end my slide seminar with the uh, kind of different note that seeking diagnosis without sequencing or molecular tests, we do have really good uh, markers now. Uh, and you can reach a diagnosis with reasonable confidence without molecular diagnostic. Uh, this has become possible because of some fantastic work. In the past, we have worked from morphological diagnosis to genetic diagnosis. Now we are reverse learning. We have a genetic diagnosis, uh, and then we start learning how do they look, how, what is the expression profiling, how, what protein do they express, and, and, and get a diagnostic antibody as a surrogate for translocation. And uh, I just suggest that this kind of uh, the pathway which is kind of just exclude there is no differentiation so that and once you reach here there's some easy way to just get to a common diagnosis 95 percent are going to be the even sarcoma so you do the field got ct99 and kx2.2 good positivity just stop there otherwise you could do these markers etb4 wt1b core or do a rearrangement fish and if you're positive you can classify them as and if it is, I think there are going to be small subgroup which is still going to be uh, undifferentiated. And these are the ones where RNA sequencing panels should be done. Now, it all depends on where you're working, how resourceful you are. I know a lot of labs in Europe, they do sequencing in all cases. We have an option of doing sequencing on all cases, in fact, whole exome sequencing, but don't expect results coming back to you so that you can treat your patients because they take very long time and probably you have to have a quicker immunistic chemistry fish and those uh, or even RT-PCR where you could get a quick turnaround time so that treatment can be catered. Uh, I was talking about fish so I found some interesting ones here. You could have EWSR gene break apart changes in cases of any one deficient tumors or small B uh, deficient tumors. And the reason being any one is tend to be very close to EWSR in, in the chromosome. And so once it is deleted, it somehow disrupts, it can disrupt e EWSR as well. Another good thing uh, that you can diagnose with fish is EWSR1 and FATC2 using just a break apart probe for EWS. Uh, the reason being that is usually up a kind of amplification of a telomeric probe signal of EWSR. Can you see lots of dots? Normally, the, in this particular probe, what they are showing that this should, should have been just two dots. And so, so amp if you're seeing rearrangement of EWSR with amplification, uh, even if you don't have NFATC2 fish, you could suspect that. I think uh, now I want to especially thanks to, to Mark Atherton. He's uh, 
kill a lot of fishes for us and will help with a lot of diagnosis. And this is our department. Uh, these are my colleagues um, and, and a fantastic uh, biomedical scientist here. And um, I've, I've kind of recently uh, giving my head of the department ship to Dr. Harrell. And so that I can focus on more on my research interests and uh, my role as a evening, uh, sorry, Wilms Tumor Review uh, nationally. Um, and thank you all. Thank you, uh, Dr. Shukla. That was an excellent, excellent lecture. The last uh, slide, the algorithm you showed was a very good one. That is, if in a resource constraint setting, but I would still ask you, that at the end of it in your practice what percentage is what percentage is left as as undifferentiated round cell sarcoma in your practice and one more thing is we have dr radhika srinivasan with us who is and she has asked that if you can comment on implications for management in the tumors that you have discussed oh the, that's a very interesting question i think very valid as well uh, okay, so I would say uh, it is getting less and less uh, unclassified tumors. Having said that, you still will have around, uh, I would say, 5%. Uh, but the thing is, a lot of cases which I've shown were diagnosed five years back and, and we didn't make a diagnosis six years back. So probably. Uh, now it's going to be far less. Uh, with regards to treatment, and, and, and uh, all of our job is about um, kind of treatment and, and prognostication and all. And you know, Dr. Radhika has rightly said, at the moment, all many of these tumors get the same evening sarcoma therapy. But I think soon, as we have a male, larger cohort, this is uh, the the sick duck sarcomas because are still rare tumors and all these trials need a lot of lot more cases so at the moment they are being tagged with uh, uh with even sarcoma group having said that there are kind of a lot of uh, experimental therapy mainly in disseminated ones where they're trying new things and in the future as we know and identify more targets in these pathways, probably it will be re become relevant. And unless we diagnose them, we'll never reach there. Right. And there's one more comment. The last case that you showed. The Please go ahead. The last case that you showed, Dr. Bala Morgan, as soon as you showed the HNE with the mixoid, made a diagnosis of BCOR as soon as you showed the slide. So this is just a comment and for yeah. Dr. Martin. Credit, I think that's the beauty of morphology is uh, that you can make the and that's what my point was that all these fancy tests were very important initially but now going back we have uh, identified kind of morphological clues and immunistic chemistry to these diagnoses, yes. Right. So that was an excellent talk, uh, Dr. Rajiv Shukla. Thank you so much. Thank you uh, so much for taking for making it so simple and in a resource constrained setting where you don't have a molecular lab, you can still make a diagnosis as you has as he has shown both for the B corp and the sick duct tumor. So this was excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Rajiv. Uh, thank you, and uh, I'm really, I, I didn't expect uh, a lot of my teachers uh, being there, Dr. Radhika, a lot of my colleagues. I, I was hoping to talk to Kirti, yes, yeah, so, and uh, I'm I'm really happy that, uh, that uh, I could talk to them, uh, and uh, yes, thank I was hoping for bringing you on board. And it was wonderful to listen to you, Rajiv, and uh, it was great. And I learned a lot from you today. And oh, thanks, to come back again. Thank you oh, so much. Sure. Thanks a lot, man.
Right. Thank you so much, everybody. Wonderful, excellent presentation. And, and I think, as Dr. Rajiv has promised, that uh, we will be having a slide session. Nice. We will give it a try, yes. Yeah, we will give it a try. Maybe not now, maybe after a month or maybe more than that. But then we, yes. we can give a try. And we had a small five minutes, you know, practice session, remember? Uh, maybe for you. Yes, Dr. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. That, that will work, I think. But, but, but I don't think so. We need to push things fast. You take your time, and then on a given time, maybe after a month or so, or maybe two, we'll be back again with your slide session. I would request a, a thank you, everybody, for joining in. And um, I would request uh, Dr. Chatterjee to give the closing remark before we say goodbye. Thank you all for being here. And Dr. Raji, the, and both Dr. Radhika, Dr. Kirti, and, the, and everybody else, and Dr. Nadim, who is spending so much time during, uh, during this period of pandemic to bring out these lectures. This is excellent. So the credit goes a lot to Dr. Nadim for sparing the time and arranging this. Thank you, Nadim. Uh, yeah. My pleasure. I like, I, I like to second that, and he's doing a wonderful job. And thanks all who came here uh, i think ipl match was on and and, and those who are yeah. present here yeah you have you have a big team in youtube also who is wishing you know thank you to you on the youtube session as well thank you so much bye bye take okay. care bye thank you bye bye, bye. take care bye